this is the way uh, that God works. He chooses the honorine, the little ones, uh, for his great works. I have often told you that when I was ordained a priest back in 1991 on Trinity Sunday, my superior and I stayed up all night in the chapel at the Vatican where we were staying. We stayed up all night praying. We would pray the rosary, and then he would talk to me uh, like a good father, giving advice to his son. And Father Jim Flanagan is so uh, very much my spiritual father. Great, great priest. Great, great man. Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of a hero, a very humble man, but I look up to him so much. Uh, he once uh, asked his mom, his father had died uh, at a rather young age. His dad was an attorney in Boston, nine children. Uh, Father Jim's brother was district attorney of Boston probably 20 years. Had another brother, head of the philosophy department at Boston College for many years. But he once asked his mother, was dad uh, a great man? What was he really like? And his mom said, Jimmy, if you're ever half the man your father was, you will be one heck of a man. And I think he always remembered it. And he's the greatest man that I've ever met. Not just the greatest priest. He's the greatest man I've ever met. Uh, even on a human level, All-American and on the national championship, Notre Dame football team back in the 40s, Navy SEAL, many, many missions during World War II, uh, both in Europe and in the South Pacific, founded the Society of Our Lady, responsible for the ordination of hundreds of priests, done great work. And we stayed up that night before my ordination and we prayed all night long before the Blessed Sacrament. And he gave me great advice. And now, a little more than ten years later, I can tell you, I don't remember a thing he said. <laughs> except one thing. Except one thing. Always come as a servant. That's what he said to me. Always come as a servant. And everything else that he said to me was wrapped up in that, connected to that, intertwined with that. The words of Jesus from the Gospel. The Son of Man has come to serve, not to be served. Now how does that fit in to this yes, war. Before uh, John Paul became the Pope, uh, Paul VI uh, was the Pope. And he wrote an encyclical called Evangelii Nunciandi, which was on evangelization, the fundamental development of evangelization. And uh, when John Paul became the Holy Father, he felt that this work was of new evangelization, which is the same as what Father Jim in, and those who began Our Lady of Corpus Christi felt was the mission of Our Lady of Corpus Christi, to bring the young people of the world to be evangelized and their nations as well. You go first. Don't ever be, ask anybody else to do what you wouldn't do, whether you're a dad or a mom, religious superior, pastor, whatever it is. Leadership, first letter in the word, L, lead by example. 
I, I can't help when I say that, I can't help but think of our own founder, Father Jim Flanagan, who many of you know. He's always done that. He's always exemplified that. What an example. I never heard the man say no. And he'd never ask you to do anything he himself hasn't done a thousand times. Lead. Well, I remember that I, the, the society sent me over to Spain to study for a doctorate. And I remember after a couple months, I was miserable. I was over there. I didn't speak Spanish, man. They sent me over there to study on a doctoral level, and I didn't speak Spanish, and all the classes are in Spanish. I didn't know the culture, I didn't know the language, and I called up Father Flanagan one night. And I said, Father, I don't think I'm called to this. And he said, oh. I said, no, I, you know, I just don't fit in here. I'm not called to this. Um, I think maybe I should come home. And he said, oh. I, he said, well, look, refresh my memory. What did I send you over there for? I said, well, I'm supposed to study and get a doctorate degree in theology. He said, ah, theology, yeah. So what, what, you have to write a, a, a thesis to do that, right? I said, yes, Father. He said, what's your thesis? I said, it's, it's about the meaning of suffering. <laughs> and there was a long pause at the other end. <laughs> and he said, you get the point? I said, yes, Father, click. At this point, one always thanks those who have made the doctoral thesis possible. I'm particularly grateful to Father James Flanagan, <clears throat> who was the general priest servant of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, who allowed me the time to study at the University of Navarre. I'm likewise thankful to His Excellency Bishop Rene Gracida, retired Bishop of Corpus Christi, Texas, and sincerest gratitude is likewise due to Professor Lucas Mateo Seco for his constant encouragement, direction, and teaching, without which this project would not have been possible. July 16th, uh, the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity was founded on July 16th, the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, in 1958, uh, Father James Flanagan, our founder, was a priest of the Archdiocese of Boston, and from very early in his priesthood, uh, he felt um, inspired. He had a uh, the vision to found the Society of Our Lady, and the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston uh, gave him permission to do that, and we, the Society was formally founded on the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, 1958, 50 years ago. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the spirituality of the Society of Our Lady. Uh, a lot of people have been interested in that. They've asked me so many times. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, as I said, the Society of Our Lady was founded 50 years ago by Father Jim Flanagan. It's a Society of Apostolic Life. Uh, that's not a religious order, uh, properly speaking, but it is a, an institute of consecrated life. Uh, it's a special category uh, of consecrated persons. Um, the charism of the society, and you know, every religious institute, every society of apostolic life, every congregation has a, a charism or a special gift that the uh, Holy Spirit uh, gives for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the Church. And the charism of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity uh, is to work in areas of greatest apostolic need uh, through using ecclesial teams. Uh, now that uh, we always felt, and Father Flanagan felt, that's determined by the bishops. The bishop determines what the area of greatest apostolic need is, and then we try to respond to that. Uh, it might be um, working in a parish, in a uh, third world country, missionary type work. It could be a specialized ministry like my own. Uh, it, it could be working um, 
in the area of uh, rehabilitation of drug addicts, as we've done for many years in the Golden Triangle uh, of the East uh, around Thailand. And, and uh, uh, all those um, mission areas, uh, we would work uh, in concert with the bishop. The bishop would say, look, we need help in this or this or this, and then we would respond then. And we do that in a special way by working in what uh, Father Flanagan called ecclesial teams. Um, Father Jim knows something about teamwork. Uh, he was uh, an All-American end on the National Championship Notre Dame football team back in the good old days of the, the um, early to mid-1940s. Um, many sports fans remember that Notre Dame team as probably, certainly one of the greatest ever, maybe the greatest ever. Uh, so Father Jim learned about teamwork. Uh, then he was a member of a UDT, underwater demolition team, in the Navy during World War II. So teamwork is something that Father uh, understood from the beginning, and he highly esteemed it. And so we work in teams, ecclesial teams. You know that word ecclesial has to do with church, church teams. It would be uh, typically a, um, a priest would always be the head of the team. A priest, possibly a permanent deacon, uh, maybe his wife, uh, it might be a couple of our religious sisters, some lay people, working as a microcosm of the church. All of these various states in life, priest, deacon, religious sister, lay people married and single, uh, working together as a team in some area of great apostolic need. And th there you see it's like a microcosm of the church coming together uh, to accomplish a mission. Uh, the spirituality of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity is what's at the heart of it. Um, you you want to get to the substance uh, of something, and that's really the substance, the spirituality. Uh, there are a couple things that are essential. Uh, the de Montfort consecration. Many of you know who St. Louis de Montfort is. Uh, many of you don't know who he is. If you don't, you should um, read up on it. Read a book on St. Louis de Montfort or look him up uh, on uh, Butler's Lives of the Saints or uh, on, the, on the web. It's easy to do. Uh, St. Louis de Montfort was a great preacher. Uh, he oper operated in France, in uh, uh, Brittany <coughs> in particular. A uh, great preacher. Um, didn't live too long. He, he was so effective at what he did, they, they tried to kill him. Um, I remember one time when I was preaching in the early years of my priesthood, I was down in uh, the country of Belize, Central America, and I was preaching, and um, uh, the preaching uh, generated a lot of emotion, and 99.99% uh, .99 of it positive, uh, great response from the people. But there were a few who were outraged by it, and there wasn't anything outrageous for a change, that I said at that point in time. I was just talking about Our Lady, about the Blessed Mother, and I said that she is the greatest work of God's creating hand next to the humanity of Christ. Next to the humanity of Christ, Our Blessed Mother is the greatest work of God's creating hand. There were a few people who didn't like that, and um, they, um, they about threw a fit, and there was a, a, uh, a bit of a, um, <laughs> an upheaval momentarily, Afterwards, a layman uh, who uh, was with me on, on this trip in, in a fervor of spirit said, Oh, Padre, Padre, if we get just a little bit better at this, surely they'll kill us for it. And that's kind of like the, uh, the bottom line. You get good enough at, at, at uh, preaching the gospel, and, and they might kill you for it. Well, they tried to poison St. Louis de Montfort. A man tried to attack him with an axe, all kinds of things. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, for the guy with the axe, St. Louis de Montfort was uh, reported to be the strongest man in Brittany. He was an extremely strong man. In his early days, he had a temper, too. But um, that's not why they made him a saint. He overcame all that, and he, um, he went on to be, become a great saint. But he had a spirituality, which has been passed down, down to the church, um, um, called total consecration. Uh, one of the most notable um, practitioners of this spirituality was Pope John Paul II. 
John Paul the Great took as his motto, totus tuus, um, meaning everything for you, meaning the Blessed Mother. So the essence of that spirituality of St. Louis de Montfort, the total consecration, is to give everything to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the source, center, and summit of our life. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. Uh, so we give everything to Jesus. All that we are, all that we do, everything we give to Jesus Christ through the hands of Mary, our mother. That, that's the unique note of that spirituality of the total consecration. We give everything to Jesus through Mary. And this is, is, is uh, uh, in the substance, the very substance of the spirituality of, our, of the society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. It's what I've done. The Holy Spirit, uh, I know, moved me to do this from the very beginning of my vocation to the priesthood. Uh, I did it very early on after my reconversion to the faith. Um, you just, it's just an act of, of the will. You use your intellect. You know about this, and then you will to do it. Uh, you just give everything to Jesus through Mary, through an act of the will. Uh, and then you try to live out that spirituality. Um, it, I'll tell you the truth. If there's a secret uh, to my ministry and the success we've had, and we've had great success by the grace of God, uh, it is this spirituality. Um, our mother will get things done far, far faster and better than we could ever do it on our own, uh, believe me. Now, it takes a certain amount of humility and trust to do this. But after all, uh, Jesus himself gave her to us uh, as our mother uh, from the cross, the most solemn moment in, in history, turning to the disciple whom he loved, Behold your mother. Well, St. John was standing in proxy for every one of us, as it were, and we received a spiritual mother. From that point on, and, and uh, then he turned to the beloved disciple. You know, behold your mother, woman, behold your son. Uh, using that term woman, by the way, that is a universal term, meaning he gave her to all of humanity. And so we have a mother, a spiritual mother. And so we live out that consecration, and there's, there's great, great power in it. Give your life to Jesus through the hands of Mary, our mother. Don't be afraid to do that, because you know, Everything we give to the Blessed Mother, she gives to Jesus. And Jesus takes it to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this then, we get into the, uh, the substance again, another uh, dimension of the substance of the spirituality of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. The title, by the, by the way, is enormously instructive. It's not just a nice title Father Flanagan dreamed up. It's enormously theological. Uh, what it speaks about is our Blessed Mother and her relationship, and this is an important word, relation. This is of the substance of the uh, spirituality of the society, too, relationship. Relation is so important, it goes back to the first truth, the truth of God himself. There's one God, three divine persons, and, and, the, and the very persons of the Trinity, those are... are in a sense, uh, established by the relationship, the opposition of relation. Everything is one in God, except wherein the opposition of relation exists. That means the Father eternally loving the Son. The Son eternally loving the Father. The Father and the Son in an eternal exchange of love, which breathes forth or spirates the Holy Spirit. And the spirituality, then, is the spirituality of Our Lady, her relationship with the Father, her relationship with the Son, her relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the, the substance of the spirituality of the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity. Uh, we, we seek to be, uh, as Mary was, Mary is the perfect disciple. She, she's the Eternal Father's beloved daughter. She is the mother of the Son. She's the mother of Jesus, the eternal Word. Um, she's also the most perfect disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So her relationship with the Father, perfect child. Uh, her relationship with Jesus, the Son. She's the mother of the Son. Uh, the Holy Spirit, her spouse, 
overshadowed her. And what happened? When she said yes, when she accepted the word and will of God, what happened? Well, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So she's the mother of the son, and then she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So you see the relationship of our Blessed Mother with the persons of the Most Holy Trinity. This is our spirituality. It really should be the spirituality uh, of every uh, Christian and every human being, actually. After all, we have one Father. We all have the same Father. Hence, uh, we're related to the Father uh, as a child uh, to their Father, but we're also related to each other. So you see this uh, reality of relation is so important. And so you try to live as a good child of the Heavenly Father. Well, how do you know what that is? Well, you have to look at Jesus. You have to look at Jesus. But, you know, a lot of people look at Jesus and they see different things. And so how do you know the real Jesus? How do you know the authentic Jesus? Well, you don't get that from some upstart theologian who thinks he has a better idea than the Pope. That's not how you know about Jesus. You look to the church in her official teaching. That's how you know Christ. Jesus is the Word of God. Remember that in the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, his only word, Jesus. He has no more to say. Those are the inspired words of the great doctor of the church, St. John of the Cross. And so we try to be a good child of our Heavenly Father. What does that mean? It means you do His will. It means you try to discern the will of God and then carry it out. How do you know what that is? It's going to be within the parameters of church teaching. Now, if you think you, you're doing the will of God and you're, you're committing sin or you're rejecting church teaching, you're dead wrong. And we know that. To be a good child, uh, you have to be humble. Now, Our Lady is the humble handmaid of the Lord, perfectly obedient to the wishes, the will of our Heavenly Father. And she's the mother of Jesus, the mother of the Son, her relationship to Jesus Christ. She heard from our Father through the message of the angel what his will was. Uh, you, you'll become the mother of one who will save his people. Jesus, the very word means God saves. She heard this, and well, how can this be? She didn't understand it all. You know, don't worry at times if you don't understand everything. There's nothing in the Bible uh, that says without understanding it is impossible to please God. We're human. Our mind is finite. Our intellectual capability is finite. Uh, our, even Mary, the most perfect work of creation, uh, other than the humanity of Christ, even our Blessed Mother didn't understand it all. How can this be? I don't have a husband. And then the Holy Spirit said, fear not. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you will give birth to one who will save his people from their sins. She didn't understand it all, but she accepted it all. She accepted the message. She accepted the Word of God and the will of God, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mary, in a very mystical way, uh, brought forth Jesus into time and space. She said yes to the plan of God and gave Jesus his humanity. Uh, we, too, have to be receptive in that way. We have to say yes to the Word of God. We have to say fiat to the instructions which we receive from God our Father through the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we do that, we too will beget Christ in time and space. That's our mission, uh, to be uh, good children of our Heavenly Father, to be receptive, to be open to the action of the Holy Spirit. Then what happens? In a mystical way, a mystical incarnation, as it were, takes place, and we beget Christ in our own soul and then in the souls of so many others. And that's the relationship we have to Jesus. I remember one time when Father Flanagan and I were in Florida. He gave a spiritual um, conference, 
And he, and he told the people who in that group there, they, they, they were somewhat of a charismatic group. And um, they were doing good things. They had the Holy Spirit operating. He said, well, you have the Holy Spirit, and that's fantastic. But what I'm bringing you is Mary, which they didn't really have much presence of the Blessed Mother. And when you have the Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit, then what happens? Jesus. That's what happens. The Blessed Mother and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is brought forth. And that happens in individual souls, uh, as well as in, um, in, in the hearts and minds of those we come in contact with. So the relationship of our Blessed Mother to the Father and to the Son, then to the Holy Spirit. Uh, she's called the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Our Lady has that uh, mystical relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is called the Sanctifier. Uh, He's the Lord and giver of life, Uh, the one who begets the life of divine life within us. And, And for that to happen, you have to be pure. You have to be humble. Most of all, you have to be humble. Uh, and so in order to receive that power and grace of the Holy Spirit, you've got to be open. Um, believe me, people who are closed, who think they are too educated or too sophisticated uh, for this kind of simple spirituality, those people really never get far in the spiritual life. They just don't. Why? They're too proud. Arrogance blocks the channel of grace, and they get nowhere. Uh, A a lot of the greatness of the saints was because of their humility uh, and their relationship with the Blessed Mother. Pope John Paul the Great, a great contemporary example, uh, as towering an intellect as he was, as gifted a man as he was in so many ways. Uh, He was a humble man, humble enough to say totus tuus, humble enough to say to the Blessed Mother, everything for you, Mother. And what he was doing was expressing that de Montfort consecration. Everything for Jesus through Mary, our mother. Another way of saying it, the way I do it, uh, everything that I am and everything that I do, I place on the altar of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, If we had more time and perhaps in in another conference, uh, I could talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I have done that. On several occasions, I've talked about the Immaculate Heart of Mary as the mystical garden of God. Uh, This comes into the whole spirituality of the society. You know, as some of the fathers and doctors of the church said, uh, our Blessed Mother conceived Jesus in her heart, in her Immaculate Heart, before she conceived him in her womb. That, That total disposition, her orientation toward God. Uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So I, I, give, I place everything on the altar of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I'll let, I, I give it to Our Lady. And then she takes Jesus and us, one with Jesus, to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask Our Lady to intercede for me with, with Jesus, that I might become more like uh, the one who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In so doing, we actualize our potential to become who we are, members of the body of Christ. Our Lady facilitates that. I ask her to intercede with the divine spouse, the Holy Spirit, that I can be open completely to the action and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, the power of God. You know, if if there's any problem today in the world I believe it's because of problems in the church. Jesus gave his church to hold the world in being. If the church were perfectly faithful to her mission, the world would be lifted up and would not be in the the near catastrophic state that it's in today. We're we're in tough times. In case you don't know that, we are in some of the most difficult, most perilous times in history. And if you don't believe that, stay tuned. You don't believe it, stay tuned. Already on national television, in living color, you can watch the demise of this country and the world in living color. We are in desperate straits. And I will guarantee you it's going to get worse before it gets any better. 
You have to have something to hold on to in the storm. It's like, imagine being out on the ocean. You ever see some of those movies like Perfect Storm or The Guardian with some of that um, tremendous um, um, cinematography of, of, the, of the ocean? Imagine being out there in the ocean in the dark with huge 30, 40 foot waves, a violent storm crashing you. You have to have something to hold on to. Uh, these are tough times. We're going through violent storms. You've got to be able to hold on to something solid. And what I'm giving you here, this, this, this spirituality is as solid as a rock because it's based on the rock who is Christ. Mary helps to bring us, to graft us into that rock who is Jesus the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, thus taking us to the Father. And then we, that, that's really the meaning of life. That's the reason we're on the face of the earth, to come into union with the most holy trinity. Our Blessed Mother helps us to do that. Some practical ways to do this. You know, you, we need to have concrete things. Number one, cultivate humility. Remember what it is. Uh, humility is the acknowledgement of truth. What does that mean? It means this. I acknowledge who God is. God's everything. God's the creator, the all-powerful. The all-loving, the all-merciful, that's God. Me, I'm a speck of dust. I'm a creature, finite, but God loves the speck. Now that's the truth. The acknowledgement of the truth is humility. You've got to be humble. Number two, pray the rosary every day. I've been saying it from the beginning of my ministry. I'll say it till the day I die. Pray the rosary and do it every day. It's the prayer of the gospel. Hence, it is very, very power, powerful. What's the gospel? The word means good news. What's the good news? The good news equals Jesus Christ. When you pray the rosary, you are praying the gospel, the good news. You're praying Jesus. You begin to interiorize Jesus. You become who you are, the body of Christ. And that's the meaning of human life. And Our Lady helps us to fulfill that. And then receive the sacraments. Uh, oh, at a minimum, you've got to go to Mass on Sunday. You've got to go to Mass on Holy Days of Obligation. You know, we're told that in North America, as many as 80% of Catholics don't even go to Mass regularly anymore. Now, that's a precept. You must do that. That's not optional. Now, now if you have a good reason, you're too sick to leave the house. Uh, you have a sick child you have to take care of. You absolutely have to work. Um, you know, there are serious reasons, but, but it, it, barring a serious reason, it's a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sundays or ho Holy Days of Obligation without a good reason. So, and go to confession. Go to confession once a month. Now, you know, that's an arbitrary number. I'm not saying you have to do it at, at that time, but do it regularly. Let me say that. Do it regularly. And if you say, you know, well, I don't have any sins, then you're not examining your conscience. You have sins, and so do I. We're sinners. And God gave us the great gift of confession uh, in order to, to receive peace. So go to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Go to confession on a regular basis. Pray. Pray every day at set times. You know, if you just do it haphazardly, you might not do it. Early in the morning is the best time. Get up early. Get up early. If you can go to Mass... By all means, that's the greatest. Do that. Go to daily mass. If you can't, then set a, a quiet place aside in your home, uh, a, a, a room. Make a little chapel. If you, you can't afford to have a whole room, just a corner of a room. Put a little table there with a little cloth, uh, a crucifix, an image of Our Lady. Go in there and pray. Pray the rosary. Read the Bible. Try to make a holy hour. Best way is before the Blessed Sacrament, but if you can't, it's still powerful to do it at home. Um, divide it up. 15, 20 minutes for the rosary. 15, 20 minutes to read the Bible. 15, 20 minutes study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Catholics are ignorant of their faith, and that is a sin. It is a sin mostly on our part, mostly on the part of the priests, the hierarchy. We have not done a good job of instructing the faithful. Uh, and, and if you want to take issue with that, I'll just, you can, we'll, we'll, we'll prove my point. I'll go and test the people. I'll give them an exam. 
of simple questions. I did it for years in my ministry, every place I went. And, he, and the most active people, you know, would come. And so they would have been the ones who would, would have done the best. The average grade was 42% failing. We need to learn, learn our faith. Ignorance of the faith, just like ignorance of Scripture, is ignorance of Christ. Ignorance is dangerous. And that's the reason our world is in the disastrous condition. I, I can, I'm telling you, the decline of our country and the decline of our world is directly proportional to the decline of power inside the Catholic Church. Why is that? Because too many of our members have lapsed. They don't receive the sacraments, they're not living in a state of grace, and we've fallen into a state of decline. That has to change. Because if it doesn't change, the country and the world are going to collapse into chaos. And you won't believe how bad that'll be. And so, learn your faith. You'll find that in the end, three things are essential. Absolutely essential. Many other things may be essential too, but these are essential. Number one, have that really authentic, vibrant love for and relationship with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Love your mother. Your mother loves you. She will bring you into a relationship with her son, Jesus. Especially Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. That's number two. You've got to have a great love and devotion to Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Number three, you've got to have uncompromising love and fidelity for the Pope, the Holy Father, and the Magisterium of the Church. Those three, Jesus in the Eucharist, the Blessed Mother, and the Holy Father in the Magisterium. Those are like a, a three-ply cord. And a three-ply cord, as Father Jim used to say, and it's the words of Scripture, a three-ply cord is not easily broken. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye. Amen.